discussion centered around the beautiful film, Farewell or More. Let me just get into a few little housekeeping um, items before we start. Um, today's event is sponsored by Oxfam and we're going to record this session and it's going to be English closed caption, which is available and you can find the closed caption button in your list of tools on your Zoom screen. You can ask questions anytime using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'll do my best to get to everyone's questions and get them answered as quickly and as expediently as possible. So having said that, Farewell or More is a film that has reuni reunited a couple after 17 years, an Angolan couple, immigrant couple, um, after 17 years. They're now strangers sharing a one bedroom apartment and they discover a shared love of dance that may help them overcome the distance. It may not, we are gonna talk about it. So let me just start with the person who's the captain of the ship, the director, producer, and writer of Farewell Amour, Ekwa Masangi. Hi everybody. <laughs> I'd also like to bring to the screen <clears throat> And let me just say, we had a little discussion off camera because I don't like people butchering my name, so I'm not gonna butcher theirs. <laughs> so I'm gonna bring the, our leading man onto the screen. He plays the role of Walter. He was born in Uganda, has a master in fine arts at NYU's graduate acting program at the Tisch School of the Arts and has studied at the Royal National Theater. You've seen him in Blood Diamond, The Shy, Queen of Katwe and Treme on HBO. Go ahead and say your name, baby, so everybody can get it right from now on. Uh, well, I wanted just to correct, I wasn't born in Uganda. Uh, I was born in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, That's right. I do this every time I talk to you. My it's bad. A, it's, it's all good. <laughs> all right. But <laughs> let's do your name. Let's do your name. Ntare Guma Mbaho Mwine. Thank you. And thank you for that correction. I do this every time I talk to you. I, Boom, boom. It's all Let me good. Hit myself upside the head. It's all good. <laughs> Next, we're going to bring up our leading lady, Zainab. She hails from the theater, as does my brother Walter, aka Walter. And you've seen her in performances in Denai Guerra's Eclipsed, Venus Girl, I mean, Venus School Girl, and so many more. She plays the strong willed Esther in Farewell Amor. Welcome, my dear. Hi. Thank you. Hi. And last but not least, we're bringing to the stage Isra Chakra. Isra is a civil rights activist who campaigns and she's an advocacy expert and public speaker. She serves as the refugee migration protection campaign leader at one of the leading international NGOs in the world and one of the sponsors of T-O-D-A-U Oxfam, where she uses her campaign expertise in managing campaign that advocates for vulnerable people, such as refugees, asylum seekers, temporarily protected status or TPS holders, and opposes discriminatory policies, such as the Muslim ban, which just got lifted this week by President Biden. So welcome, Isra. It's my pleasure to have all of you on the stage today. Yay! <laughs> Unmute yourself, Isra. We can't hear you, baby. I was saying thank you. I'm really happy to be here and talk about, you know, Oxfam and the incredible work that we're doing. Yes. Thank you for being here. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. So let's start talking about this film. You know, I got to, you know, the question I'm going to ask y'all. Every time I see y'all, I ask this question right out the gate. We're going to talk about those sheets. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk about those sheets. <laughs> So let me so let me phrase let me phrase that question a little bit better. Okay. There's a moment in the film, and for those who are watching or who haven't seen it yet, there's a moment in the film where Walter is hiding these sheets in the closet. And Esther finds the sheets and she puts the sheets on the bed, and some things happen. Walter finds out about it and freaks out. So I want to get everybody's perspective about the sheets. I'll start with the person who put it on the screen in the first place in the written form, Ms. Equa. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes. Um, you know, I just, I thought it would be just um, a fun way to 
to depict, um, you know, like a symbolism of what he is missing, what he's longing for, this olfactory um, aspect where, you know, it's not a picture, it's, it's not anything um, usual, I suppose. Um, and, but, it, it, but it, it, it's so powerful, you know, like somebody's smell. Right. And, you know, and I had all these stories in my mind about where the sheets came from and, you know, they had bought them at the sale at Macy's at one point and, you know, had used them a few times and she was supposed to have taken them with her because they were her sheets or their sheets um, and she forgot them. And so and he's was supposed to have thrown them out and he's going to get to it. He's going to get to it, but he's just not ready yet. Um, and so and that's sort of like the 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 symbolism of him sort of he's working on it he's you know that's what he's working that's at least what my intention was um i'd love to know from tari at least in terms of your um working on the set maybe if there's something different that came to mind for you as you were working with the sheets no i think it's a great you know symbol because i mean it's tough when you've broken up with someone to completely cut off and let go and sometimes there's objects of theirs or belongings of theirs or even something of yours that they might have worn that come, they, their spirit somehow is in there. And if you're still connected to that person, if you haven't completely cut off, there's your relationship becomes with this inanimate object. And so Walter would walk by that closet and knew she was in there and couldn't resist just taking a smell of her. You know, and I think he realized it was getting to be too much, you know, hiding these sheets in the closet. So he tried to throw them out, put them outside to throw them away. And unbeknownst to him, his wife discovers them, and puts them in the Frugal. bed, makes, the bed makes the bed with them. <laughs> and when they're having a, the first sort of uh, reconnection, reconnection <laughs> for PG, we help a brother out. <laughs> For PG purposes, yes. Uh, he <laughs> discovers the sheets are on the bed. And so that's like having Linda, his uh, mistress, in like right there with them, mm -hmm. uh, which he can't handle. And he completely breaks down and freaks out because he, he, he's, been, he's been outed, really. And I think um, Zaina played that so beautifully because I think some sort of, I'll let her speak to it, but. Thank yeah, Zainab, I'd love to, you're the only person I haven't had this conversation with at this point. I'd love to get your point of view on it. Um, for me, I feel like there was a part of me, it's so strange because it came as really quite a, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. It felt, that moment felt really, really um, new, like it was happening in the moment for me because I don't know whether it was subconsciously or not, but I had actually overlooked that certain certain areas in the script. Like my brain somehow did not want to engage with it. Like whenever it came to him opening the sheet, open the closet, with the sheet, I would just skip over it going, well, what's going on with these sheets? I don't care. You know, I like my, it's like, a, you know, it's only recently I started thinking out, why did I do that? I kept just brushing it aside, not really taking in the significance of it. And so when it happened in that moment, it felt really new, just thought, oh my God, the betrayal of this uninvited menage a trois. I did not ask for this. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the deal. And um, so it was, um, I mean, I think her reaction was completely, completely honest and real and raw. It's what you would do. I mean, and uh, at that moment, you just, it's just the whole world just comes, comes crashing down and it's such a betrayal you know, because they'd been struggling so long and so hard to reconnect. Mm. And they were just, this was the moment they were almost there. And then what? <laughs> <laughs> it was a beautiful moment though. It was, it was, it was, there were so many adjectives that I could layer onto that moment. It was beautiful. It was complicated. It was tricky. It was a lot of different things, but there's not one person that's going to watch that moment and not relate to it. Because like Intere said, there's something about when you when you break up with somebody, you always want to keep a piece of them somewhere. And for him, it was the sheets. So, you know, you y'all know that I had to go there. I had to ask you that because that's like my favorite thing to ask about this film. <laughs> it really is. 
Um, Ekba, you are someone that is of African descent. How important is it for you to cultivate your culture within your art? And before you answer that, let's just pay homage to the fact that the Sundance Film Festival kicks off today. And this time last year, y'all were at Sundance. Mm -hmm. You were on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know? So let's yes. just honor that and honor the fact that the Sundance Institute helped you with a fellowship. And, you know, let's speak to all of that, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. A, a year ago, we were all, all three of us and um, more of our colleagues were there. And, um, and that's actually where we met Oxfam as well after our screening. Um, and it had been such a journey getting there, not just for this particular project, but for me in general, having uh, grown up in Kenya, my family's from Tanzania, I grew up in Kenya and I grew up at a time where there was no local programming. There wasn't any, there weren't any images that reflected me or my people or anyone around me other than the news. Um, in any kind of way that made sense. Mm. Uh, we had a few slapstick comedy type things. And so, you know, I was inspired at a very young age to take on filmmaking as a way of correcting that. Um, I come from a very large family that has a lot of beauty and drama and humor and all of the things. And it just really irritated me that we never got to see that um, ever depicted anywhere. Um, and so, you know, many years later um, to be able to premiere this film, which is inspired by a story um, that takes place in my family of, you know, inspired by the relationship of an aunt and uncle who've been separated for almost over 20 years and still have been, still are separated to date. Um, and, you know, and sort of blossoming that into the what if story, what would happen if they were reunited and also being able to draw in other parts of the continent as well. Um, Angola is not a place that I've been to. Um, I don't speak Portuguese either, but I'm very much a lover of the dance and culture and music from Angola. And so wanting to bring that element in um, and being able to present that on the largest stage that we have in this country for independent films is, um, not it's something that's not lost on me that's hugely hugely significant and then to be at this point right now where we're able to present you know said story to you know these kinds of audiences to a voting members at the academy to oxfam members to you know everybody is is really kind of um incredible and you know the the support that i've had from both cast and crew you know is is also very, very significant, but also just very, um, it's also not lost on me, the meaning of, you know, when people are able to relate to it. And I think, you know, the reason that we started speaking with Oxfam was because of, you know, even though our film doesn't specifically address, you know, policies that are in government right now as we speak, um, to me, what was important about this film was being able to just look at the human impact that certain policies might have, like separation of families, um, in a way that we don't think about. You know, it's not just like the visible wounds of people coming out of war zones and stepping on bombs or whatever, but what happens with like the low, the slow um, demise of connections and really, and how does that affect people and what happens from there? So. It's it's a it's it's un, it's uh, it's something that I, I struggle to describe what it feels like, but amazing is the, the closest word I can think of. I have something that in which you described it perfectly. It's a, it's a quote that you that you said. You said there's a way as an African telling stories about Africans that are not within certain stereotypes that be people get very confused about. Mm -hmm. And so that meant having to constantly negotiate and explain things that are inherent to us that may not make sense to you because of a limited awareness. Yeah, yeah. I think Thank that's- you. Yeah, girl, I got you. I told y'all I got you. <laughs> We've mentioned Oxfam quite a few times in the, the course of answering your questions, Equa. I'm gonna switch the stage to Isra, excuse me for a second and talk about what Oxfam does and how important it is for you 
to collaborate in these types of discussions and events around filmmakers that are making films on these important subjects. Yeah. Thanks so much, Carla. And thank you, Apple, yeah. for that beautiful response. Um, I'm always in awe of being with you all in this conversation. And I'm so grateful to be able to witness some of the reflections of your art. So just wanted to say that. Thank you to everyone who tuned in again. I want to talk about the work that Aksum does in particular on family separation, because the story is so aligned with the many, many human impact journeys and stories that we work with and people who we work with and advocate for here at Oxfam. And in particular, over the past four years that have been incredibly challenging, fighting Trump's family separation policies every single day and his targeting of different communities every single day. And what we've seen throughout our work at Oxfam in advocating for these benefits beneficiaries globally, right, at the root of where a lot of these humanitarian crises are happening and following them in their journey of seeking safety and refuge and protection that every human should be given and afforded, all the way to advocating for the policies here in the U.S. when they are here in our country of how to ensure that we are serving them, that they live a life of safety, of dignity, and of respect here. And so the policies that we've really faced have been detrimental to these communities. They've taken a toll physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, the family members have been separated for over four years, you know, being personally impacted by the Muslim and African bands in particular. For me, I haven't seen my Syrian extended family members over the past four years, and even longer because of the conflict in the country. But the fact that the US made it legal to ban them because of a president who was very much rooted in creating policies that were divisive, that established fear mongering and were hateful. And the impact of that, of those policies, like the Muslim and African bans on myself and my community who've been impacted by it, are moments and occasions missed that, that can never be erased and got, you know, brought back to us. You know, graduation ceremonies, wedding ceremonies, the welcoming of new grandchildren. These are all experiences that every family should have every right to be there together and present um, in these things. And the fact that we've been banned from that uh, has just been detrimental. However, we obviously are welcoming and are proud of the first steps that President Biden has taken, including repealing this ban. But it's definitely not the not all that is needed to be done. There are so many communities that are still facing uh, family separation policies, and you know we're expecting President Biden to announce you know a comprehensive plan um, on what reuniting these families looks like early next week. Uh, that is something that we've been planning for as Oxfam. We're ready to respond to. We've been pushing and advocating for every single day for the past four years with our supporters. And just to turn the gear into um, to not take up too much time on why it's so important to connect with filmmakers and creatives is because they can tell a story that many things in policy and legislation can't. They, they influence the American public and society in a way that members of Congress can't. And that's really important to be able to connect to hearts and minds and shift hearts and minds in a way that people see the human impact, not just statistics and words on a piece of paper of policies like this. It's really important because that's how you build a society and a community that cares. That's how you build activists and supporters who want to engage and take action. And so being able to connect with filmmakers and actors and creatives like what we have today on the panel is so important because it helps us tell the story of the people that are really impacted by these policies. Okay, Miss Israel, you want me to have a lighter and just be like this. Give <laughs> you some snaps and claps. You make me want to jump and be an activist like yesterday. Thank you. You already are, Carla. You already are. Thank you for that insightful, like, I can't even find enough adjectives to say what kind of answer that was. That was fantabulous. I do want to ask you before we jump off this subject temporarily, you mentioned in the course of answering me that you were personally impacted by everything that's happened in the last four years. How has COVID in particularly impacted your life and not in the, in accordance with the ban during this time? And do you think that, um, with the new president that th is, is starting to look hopeful and that we'll see a shift in the change moving forward. Yeah, of course. I mean, we talk about my family also being in a humanitarian conflict zone. So the idea that they are there in a place where COVID tests and of, of course vaccines are definitely not present and not as, as in supply to meet the demand is challenging. It's challenging to feel helpless and to feel that I can't do anything to really support them beyond the specific measures of you know financially where we can and when we can, but the current economic system there and the current context in which they're living just proves 
to be very challenging for you to help anyone. And so, you know, as, as me personally, you feel a lot of survivor's guilt. You feel the fact that I'm here, me and my direct immediate family, born and raised in the US, and I can't do anything to bring them to safety and have them have all their needs met um, as any human should have. It's, it's really challenging. And it's something I've struggled with for the past four years, but especially with the pandemic, it just shows you even more so and makes me more feel more motivated to do everything I possibly can to continue to fight for not just my family members and my community, but for anyone who's been separated and who's been dealing with the same situation away from their family members. I will just say on, on Trump's policies, I want to really give a shout out to our staff at Oxfam who sued the Trump administration multiple times over the past four years on their family separation policies. And because of that direct legis uh, litigation, we've been able to reunite hundreds of families together on the border, and the, which would open up the doors for thousands actually to be reunited now. And we are going to continue to push those same policies even under the Biden administration. So the impact of COVID proves to us that we need to ensure that immigrant essential workers are in COVID relief packages, that they're represented, that they are also given support during this time, and that we don't stop resettling people and welcoming people um, into our country due to the pandemic and using that as a reason to not welcome people that are in need of the safety and safe haven. Thank you so much for addressing that for me, because as you were speaking, I was like, wow, I wonder how COVID is affecting all of this, because it affects everybody, but it's different when you're not in the U.S., and it is globally um, affecting everyone disproportionately. So thank you for, for answering that for me. I, I really appreciate it. I want to talk about the impact that dance has in this film, in Farewell Amour, because it seems to be something for Walter that ties him to these two women in very different ways, right? So there's the scene where he's in the club dancing with his girlfriend. And then there's the scene where he gets his wife dressed up and she she goes out and they cut in the rug in the middle of the restaurant. So I wanna know, Equa, what was your thought process in including that because that was a different way of them connecting. You know, oftentimes when we see stories that deal with a man and a woman on a romantic level or on a family level where there's some type of conflict, it usually revolves around fighting and yelling and, um, you know, other violent things. But this was a really soft, very sensual way of connecting everybody that was very powerful. And I just wanted to know if you wouldn't mind sharing why you chose yeah. the form of dance to make that connection. Yeah, thank you. I mean, for me, um, as a dance lover, as a dance practitioner, um, dance is a language and I wanted to be able to provide a third language for my characters to be able to communicate with um, and communicate the things that are under the surface that they're not comfortable enough to say, because you know, they're also in this situation where it's been 17 years, like they're not gonna start screaming at each other, right? Everything's big, like it works, right? We're together, right? We should be so happy, right? You know, and it's hard. And so they're struggling with how to politely but impolitely, you know, figure out how to connect. Um, and the particular dance style that um, the Walters character practices is called Kizomba and it's a very beautiful sensual couples dance from Angola um, which unlike other couples dances um, does not have a regular foot pattern and so you can't just sort of phone it in and you know it, it, do whatever you're doing without paying attention you actually do have to have a certain form of communication and connection between two dancers in order to perform the dance. Otherwise, you won't be able to perform the dance. And I just thought that was an interesting metaphor for this couple that met as dancers once upon a time during the war. Um, you know, Angola had a 30 year civil war where um, a lot of parties and those kinds of things was illegal. So people used to have underground parties called kizombas. Um, and that's, you know, in my imagination, it's not necessarily, it's, I think it is mentioned in the film, that is where they connected initially, that's where they fell in love and got married and had a child, and then separation happened, and now they've basically fallen out of step. However, he has been able to develop that connection with somebody else, 
And we see that, you know, in his chapter where, you know, he's he's very stiff, he's very quiet, he's very still until the point where he goes to that club and we see a completely different side of Walter. Um, and it's really encapsulated in the connection that he has to that particular woman and the fact that they are in sync and they're able to dance and that's the person that he's supposed to unsync himself with. Um, and sink himself to this other person who's changed and is not dancing to the same music anymore, quite literally. So, um, so that's where that came from. I loved it. I loved both of those scenes. They brought me great joy and brought a smile to my face, as I'm sure it does for everybody that sees it, because it's just, it's a very intimate way of connecting without being that intimate. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was very beautiful, and I enjoyed that. Z. I want to talk to you about how strong you made Esther in this story. She was strong. She was somebody's wife. She was church going. She didn't drink. She wanted her daughter to be educated in order to become a doctor. Um, there were so many things about her that you were like, yes, yes, yes. You were rooting for her. You also were not having the fact that by her being in America, you felt like she was losing part of her culture and losing part of herself. At one point, you even say in the film, I will not lose my daughter to this country. And I just wanted to know how all of that resonated for you in crafting the character of Esther. Um, I think in it really resonated for me in the simple fact that I am a fam I am a child of immigrants myself. And Equa really tuned into the discussions and the subjects that are discussed at home. For instance, I grew up in England and my family from Sierra Leone. And she, Equa basically wrote everything my parents, I heard my parents say, you know, you're gonna to go to medical school or law school and, and I'm not losing my child to this country because you know, the whole thing is you're gonna come here, get your education and then go back and give back to your country and make it better and build it up and all that, especially if it's on the on the aftermath of a war or just after colonization, all of that stuff. And so my work was actually done for me because it was on the page. Equa just wrote it so clearly. So she, she was able to touch on all the points that would resonate and land on me. And all I had to do was channel my family, my mother, my aunties, everyone I know who's I've heard that we've all had those conversations. And I mean, my parents were so strict, I wasn't even allowed to have after school activities except maybe piano lessons. I had piano lessons twice a week and then my other act after school activities was math tutors that came to our home because you were going to get those grades and you're gonna go become a doctor or lawyer and then you're going to go back to Sierra Leone. And <laughs> build up wow. the country. And so, you know, it was um, that scene when I sat and talked with um, Sylvia, I've had those conversations with my mother and my aunt. So, so it was like, it just, it grounded me because it put me right in a really realistic, familiar place. There's another moment that you have too that resonated with me when you say he is the man God has given me. And it resonated and it stuck with me because many women that are faced with a situation where there's that uncomfortableness after getting re, trying to reconnect. Mm -hmm. There's the un, after you know you found out he's been with someone else. There's also the love that you have that's not gonna it's not gonna disappear overnight. Like it's it's just not gonna go anywhere. But yet and still, as that strong Christian woman, you're like I'm not giving up that easy. I'm not going anywhere. He is the man that God has given me, and we are gonna make this work. Yeah, that that for me took, I had to dig deep into my acting tool bag for that moment. <laughs> Let me just say, <laughs> I, was, I heard myself saying that when, <laughs> you're like, oh, oh, okay, Esther, I need Esther to come into my, my body right now because Zainab was fighting tooth and nail against that saying, this is the man that God has given me. I will, mm -mm, um, no, <laughs> I will go find one for myself at this point. <laughs> So, but it was so true to the character though, because she, you know, in her, in her new path of religion and absolute trust and faith in a higher power and she'd given herself into it, that is, it, it's the most logical step 
that she would have taken, you know, because I know so many women in real life who don't even have that religious guidance, who, who do stay in those relationships because they decide we're going to make it work, whether it's for the children or whether it's for, for whatever reason, but you know, you have to make it work. Now I myself don't have children, so it's easier for me, Zainab, to say, no, good night, <laughs> God bless. <laughs> You're like, I'm good. Yes, I'm good, bye-bye. You're like deuces. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Go with God. <laughs> and I also wanted to address why I have you um, to talk about how you getting this dress from your neighbor played so beautifully by Joie Lee is, is used as an impetus to try to reawaken um, your husband's desire for you because he was not, he was, you know, finding excuses and acting all shady and crazy and stuff. So you were like, well, maybe, you know, if I get fluffed up and he sees, you know, what he really has, he's going, you know, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> yes. Well, she really needed, Esther really needed um, uh, Joie's character to really fluff her up because she was thinking, I just need a handbag. <laughs> uh, everything's fine. And, and, you know, Joie was like, you need more than that if you're going to keep this man. I mean, he's been in America, he's seen the light. <laughs> he has seen the flavors and the, and the uh, all of the feathers and fluffies. So you need- He's been in the fruit that. basket, honey. He done plucked out a few. The abundance that is America. <laughs> get on the good foot, young lady. Uh-uh, not get on the good foot. Ooh, that is hilarious. Why are you quoting James Brown? That is pure comedy. <laughs> She needed that. <laughs> it was it was wonderful. I I, I loved how um, there was that character. I love that there was that character of Joali, that American, that African American character that yeah. thinks they so woke, they so hip, they so. <laughs> My favorite scene is when she takes you to the African store to buy stuff, and she's throwing out all these names, and you're looking at her like, really? Yes. <laughs> Are you really trying to be more African than me? And oh. I'm really African. I mean, it's, I've experienced that so much. It's always hilarious. I love those moments where I always just find myself looking at someone in Askins, like, they say, well, that's what you do back home, right? And I'm like, no. Oh, no, I, they say, is that what you do back home? Yeah, they'll say, you do that. That's, you know, back in the motherland. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, no, not back in the motherland. Okay. <laughs> and I find myself going, no, I have never done that. We never did that back home, ever. I grew up there. I, I, have, I know not what you speak of, but I love the sentiment of wanting to connect. You know, you yeah. appreciate it. It's a, it's a wonderful, it's not even offensive. It's more just, it's actually quite, I find it endearing in a way. You know, it's almost like, it's clearly a need to find a connection, looking for a connection with that other person or for themselves, for the personal self. So. Yeah, it's never meant in malice. It's always yeah. meant as a way to connect in in yeah. um in a different kind of way, you know, to what the culture is and, yeah. and all of that. And I sometimes it. it's I just not it. done as graceful as one would yeah. like. Yes. <laughs> it's the but best always, way to say it. But it's always endearing. I always find it endearing, I have to say. <laughs> Equa is over there cracking up at me. You are so funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, for both um Intere and Z, I want to ask you. Both of you are in situations as Walter and Esther in the film where you find yourself doing whatever you need to do in the name of family. Have you ever found yourself in a position in real life where you've had to make a decision in the name of family that didn't necessarily resonate with you in your heart? Mm. I'll go with ladies first. Go okay. Esther, please. Equa. <laughs> oh, I, that was for entire antenna, but <laughs> yeah, it was for y'all. But Equa can answer. Okay. Um, something that I've had to do for family that I didn't want to do in my heart. Not that I didn't want to do, but oftentimes what I'm not able to do. You know, um, similar to what Israel was talking about. You know, with different policies with financial situations oftentimes you know just oftentimes we're limited as to what we can do there is also an aspect of um you know when you've lived here for a while the perceptions that people have of what your life is and how things are going and you know all these facebook posts you have clearly you must be making millions of dollars over there you know and so also wow 
explaining like the the American experience for me, you know, who is not on MTV Cribs and is not a superstar, <laughs> whatever. You did not say MTV Cribs. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, those things are exploited a lot. And so people have a lot of expectations um, that is confusing. And the flip side, too, and we're, I'm seeing this a lot more now, you know, 2020 COVID times, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's murder, where people are confused as to, like, what is going on in the U.S.? And so tr having to try and explain those kinds of things, trying to explain policies, trying to explain you know, government and, you know. Uh oh, she froze. froze. Well, until she comes back, Z, can you go ahead and pick up where, where Equa left off? I mean, I, I piggybacking on what she said about, you know, trying to explain to people back home what the reality of living here or living abroad, living away from, you know, the continent it's always really difficult because like she like she said they always assume you know you're making tons of money you live in a fabulous home and you clearly can just send just you know you you don't have the the challenges that you that you had back home you and they not they don't realize you actually do you just have different challenges much more difficult ones and but when it comes to doing things for family i, I have not found myself in a place where it's been I've had to make a sacrifice because for me, it's like, it's family. It's their number one. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no discussion. There's no compromise when it comes to family. Absolutely. And today? Uh, well, I think what was challenging for Walter in this film was he wants to do everything he can for his family. Mm -hmm. but he's not forthright about everything in his life. Um, Absolutely. But what's interesting is how he's able to be completely honest with Linda, with the mistress, and tell her about his wife and his child and that he's trying to bring them here. Um, so I think, I think he might feel that sharing that news might shatter the family, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that can be difficult to, you know, sometimes in families there's, mm -hmm. There's things that you, you don't want to deal with because you're worried that they might break things apart. Um, but uh, sooner or later, they're going to come up, whether regardless of what you try to do. And that could be finding the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, that's a challenge that everyone faces. Is just like, I just want to bring you into that conversation, Isra. Have you... Um, been in a situation where there was something that you knew you felt obligated to do for your family, but you were like, uh, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I want to do this. Uh, I mean, I, I relate to what Zainab was saying in terms of for family, you do anything and everything you have to do. Um, and sometimes it's complicated and sometimes the, it's not clear. Um, for me, more of the situation comes up in times where I wish I could do more. And I mm -hmm. wish I could find a loophole or a situation in which I can, I can achieve what it is that they're looking for me, what they really need me to do for them. And my family's always been so wonderful. You know, we've, we, they used to come here and visit all the time before the conflict began. Um, and we used to go visit my home country in Syria um, all the time. So I am I'm very connected to my culture. I speak the language, I cook the dishes. I, um, you know, it's really important for me to keep that tie and connection with my family. So when you're mm -hmm. so close, and you're not able to, you know, be able to apply for them to come here for a visit to attend an occasion. Um, it's really, really challenging. So I think it's more about why is the cruel system in place that prevents people from being able to do what they need to do to support their family and sacrifice what they need to sacrifice? Because I'd be willing to do it all. It's just, um, it's a lot of pressure because I don't know how to navigate systems, immigration systems when there are actual bans in place. And I don't know how to explain that to them without, with it making sense because it, it doesn't make sense, you know? No, um, it doesn't. 
I was able to go to um, Oxfam's Zatari camp and it's a, it's a refugee camp in Jordan. And I was able to meet somebody, our plaintiff, an original Muslim ban litigation that we filed with the ACLU. And I was able to meet him in person. Um, he's an incredible man named, named Khalid. And he works, he's a volunteer at Oxfam's base camp. And I just wanted to share that when, when I was going to meet him, I was so nervous because I thought they're saying like, I can understand and relate to these people on a cultural and ethnic level completely. And I know how hard it must be, but of course I can't relate and imagine what it actually feels like to be a refugee. And so I was preparing myself mentally and emotionally for how do I answer some of the questions he's gonna ask me, which he has every right and is justified to ask. So he had just, he had been approved to come and be resettled in the United States, which as you know, refugees can't choose where they're gonna be resettled. Right. But he, was, he was approved to come here. And then the Muslim ban was introduced a few weeks before his flight and him and his family and his daughters in particular, and that completely blocked them from coming here. So mm -hmm. I'm visiting a year after um, and I'm talking to him and he asks me, is for the only question I have for you is why did this happen? How did this happen? What did my family and I do to deserve this for us? Mm -hmm. And I remember it took everything in me, right? To hold back my emotion, because who am I? Uh, to show emotion when it's really them who've experienced this, right? And so it wasn't for me to say, oh, I feel so bad. That, and that's what part of the notion of immigrants in general, people sometimes want to, when they want to sympathize, um, they can put the feeling of the burden as if it's on them, but it's it's not. And so I did my best to explain factually and logically that I have no answer as to why we're in situations where we, why he was in the situation he was in, that it is unjust and that we're gonna do everything we can to fight for him. Um, and so that's sort of those sacrifices where it just becomes really challenging because I wish I could met, you know, wave the magic wand and repeal this ban from day one where it shouldn't even happen in the first place, but unfortunately no. is where we were. Good, that's a whole nother conversation we could have because I got many strong thoughts on all of that straight up. Welcome back, Equa. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> that's okay, it's technology, it happens, but I would be remiss in like having you pop back up on the screen and be like, Oh, she, oh, okay. So I had to welcome you back. Um, did you want to complete what you were saying? Um, no. Do you remember what you were saying? <laughs> if you don't remember, it's fine. I can move on. I got, I got most of it. Thank you. Okay, cool. I'll move on. I wanted to um, let y'all know about this comment that was in the chat. Um, it said from Robin Poulton. She says, magnificent statement by Ezra about the effect of COVID in US war policies on ordinary people and communities. So thank you for that. I wanted to let you know that you are being heard and you are being appreciated as, as everyone on the panel. Um, someone else says, and I'm not gonna say their name. It starts with an R. I'm not gonna butcher your name because I didn't butchered enough today already. I thought Walter, if this is for Entere, I thought Walter's restraint at not being able to comprehend Esther wanting to give the money to the church rather than helping her and the family, they thought that you played that beautifully. I wanted to let you know that was said about you. Thank you. And I also, and that same person also said the film did not put a foot wrong <laughs> as in regards to um, what Equa said about dancing. Um, it was beautifully nuanced acting, tonality of cinematography pacing, tragedy does not just disappear. So I wanted to make sure that you knew what people were saying about y'all. It's all lovely, beautiful, and wonderful, as is the film. There is a question for Entere. Um, says, I want to hear something from Walter about his perception of his role and relation to Sylvia and her dancing. That comes from Belinda Mitchell. Oh, yes, that's great. Um, Walter really struggles to connect with his teenage daughter. The last time he saw her, she was a newborn. The next time he sees her in the film is she's 17 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. And at 17, sometimes kids want, the last thing they want to be <laughs> dealing with is their parents. Uh, and he knows this. And the one window that he has in is he discovers that she has this love of dance. And he sees a reflection of himself in her. And that for me was such a beautiful way into them reconnecting um, because he is supporting his daughter in a way that his mother, her mother was not. Her mother was not for in support of the dance, even though she loved dance as a child. I think she's also wary 
of the world that comes in. She wants to protect her daughter uh, and not have, you know, very limited after school activities. <laughs> so, <laughs> Walter Walter uh, has a different parenting style and he's saying, you know, you need to, he says to her, this, this country is a very difficult country, uh, but for him, dance is a way he feels himself. And when he dances, he feels free and he encourages her to do the same. Uh, and just talking about the tradition that they come from. Uh, so for me, the dance, was not only a way to connect with his mistress, uh, Linda, and not only a way where he and his wife reconnect, but it was also a very pivotal way for he and his daughter to connect as well. You give the best answers, all of y'all. Y'all give such thoughtful, well-rooted answers. I love this so much. Speaking Man. of Linda, <laughs> you, know, you know, I gotta come back to Linda. We have not talked about Linda yet. So we got to get to Linda. I would be remiss in talking about this film without discussing Miss Linda. The most yep. powerful moment that Linda has in this film is the moment where Walter is, is, is trying to hold on to her and Esther at the same time. But Linda is the one that encourages him not to give up on his immigration fight for his family to come there. Linda is the one that encourages him to, you know, leave her alone and go and deal with his family and support his family. And mm -hmm. Equa, this is one of the themes in the film that I thought was so powerful. Every mm -hmm. woman that you showed in the film, the daughter, Linda, Esther, ev even Joie's character, all of these women are strong women rooted in some type of reality. None of them are rooted in a place <laughs> where it feels crazy, it feels, you know, out of bounds, but all of them are supportive. Walter's daughter is support, even though Walter's daughter finds out that he's had this affair, at some point the tide shifts and she supports her dad. Esther turns around and supports her husband. Even Linda supports Walter. Joie Lee's character is supporting Esther. There's a lot of support and love and family and devotion going on. And, I, and we've been talking a lot about family in the course of this discussion. Did your family upbringing make that the root of this story for you? Because it feels like it. Wow, that's awesome. Um, yes, my family is hugely supportive and has been of me um, all my life. And, you know, one of my inspirations for not just Walter, but a lot of the male characters that I write um, and female characters that I write are really based on my parents and not because they've been through the exact same thing or, you know, it's, I'm not documenting their life on screen, but specifically with my dad, you know, I had a very close relationship with my father and um, my father was an artist. My father was very proud to be an African man and to sort of have himself and um, be very self-possessed and, and was very intent having me be the same. Um, and that didn't mean, um, you know, sort of like a textbook version of being a feminist or, you know, being against fill in the blank, um, but you know, just being able to possess myself and my own faculties and be able to think for myself and, and wanting to um, demonstrate that for me as a father, as a male figure, as a father figure as well. Um, and so that's what I grew up with. I have two brothers. I actually don't have any sisters. So I grew up surrounded by men other than my mom. Um, and you know, they're all really excellent African men and I think that I mean not just African men I think it's true about black men across the board and probably a lot of men of you know other Asian men and Latino men etc cetera, etc cetera, who just get a really bad rap where we tend to focus on you know the the ones who are having the hardest time in our society the the ones who are the thugs who are the this who are the that and that tends to be the story of like what our men are like um, you know, they're brutal. Yeah, that narrative, women. that negative narrative, right. yeah. That or they're saints, you know, it's like one or the other. It's mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela or, you know, 
the fellow from the wire. So <laughs> Stringer <laughs> Bell. No. It's all good. You know? It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so wanting to, I wanted to have a different conversation about male figures and, and about the possibilities for relationships as well. Cool. I want to uh, let you know, uh, before we close out, Patricia Hackbarth wanted you to know, Equa, I love the way that Sylvia's dance wasn't aggressive like that of the other dancers, but she was about declaring who she was. She couldn't dance back at the other dancer without hatred. So I wanted you to know that. Mm -hmm. And in closing out, um, Bern Shen wants to, oh, wait, wait there's, hold on. Okay. Um, cl uh, closing out two more questions. Do you have any of, okay, wait a minute. Do any of you have follow-up projects that may also address the important issues of migration and assimilation or preservation of identity? We'll start with ladies first. We'll go with Equa and then Z and then Entare. Um, none that I can think, I can speak of at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I'm not necessarily a person who looks at like, oh, there's this issue. I need to make a project about that. I'm really more people centric. Um, I love doing films about people and as normal, you know, in between the saint and the thug, like the people that habit, that inhabit that space in between is sort of who I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. um, if it makes sense to have an issue attached to that, then it will. Um, but there is, I do have other, you know, I, I do also love the subject of the diaspora, um, the African diaspora and sort of how we live, because I feel like those are people that we hardly ever get to see um, their stories told, especially in the U.S. context. So cool. soon come, soon come. Soon coming. <laughs> what about you, Z and N today? Ah. Uh. You have any upcoming projects they may um, deal with migration, assimilation, or preservation of identity? I don't anything. I don't have anything that's that specifically to do with that subject. But you know, I am developing a bunch of stories that are based on my family, and just by dint of being an immigrant, you know, it's it's going to come into it whether I choose it or not. It's just because that's. Because that's who you are, yeah. That's who I am, yeah. And it's, a, it's about a family, uh, an African family based in London, because that's my perspective at the moment. Cool. That's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. And today? Uh, uh, I do. I just put it there. It's a film is almost exactly the same story as this one, except the roles are somewhat different. Um, I play a Nigerian father who is a priest who's been working in the US uh, and his family has been, is, are in Nigeria. Uh, and instead of it being a daughter as in Farewell Amor, it's a son. So he brings his son to the States. Mm -hmm. uh, and my character is the, the, uh, the religious blowhard uh, <laughs> of the family. Um, and he joins a fraternity, a black American fraternity, you know, and, and uh, Gets into step. It looks like a big. There's a big step dance at the end. So Ooh. the parallels to the film Farewell Amour in this are just uncanny. Well, you know, I'm all about that because I graduated from a HBCU. I graduated from Howard University, so I'm yeah. all about a good step show. <laughs> yeah. So that film actually comes out February 9th. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's me and Devil. Sorry. Yeah. And Yay! Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, some Mar and before we close out, Margaret Margaret Lacey had asked in the chat. Um, she wanted Equa to explain the title choice. Who is a more and that it, and who is it farewell to? And Equa so wonderfully said, "Farewell to who they had become in order to survive the separation. Farewell to the crutches that they were forced to develop over the years in order to be together." I love that. I think that is such a beautiful way to uh, close it all out. Um, but before we do that, I wanna thank all of our panelists for coming on and talking to us about Farewell Amour. It's been a wonderful, invigorating, lovely discussion. I love speaking with all of you. Z, this is my first time having an opportunity to speak with you as is Ezra, Isra, why did I say Ezra, Isra. 
and um, it's been wonderful. Um, we want to say to help to continue the dialogue that brings, as Isra said, help by continuing this dialogue that brings dignity to families and give to organizations that shape policy and programs, right? So like Oxfam. So you can do that by going to ox, O-X-F dot A-M slash farewell or more. Is that right, Isra? Cool. We're posting a link in the chat for you to go directly to that now to learn more and to give. Thank you, everybody. This has been wonderful. It's been my pleasure to moderate this discussion around Farewell or More. I am your moderator, Carla Renata, AKA the Curvy Film Critic. And I hope you have all have a wonderful, beautiful and blessed rest of your week and day. Thank Bye you now. so much. Thank you for having us. Yes, of course. Carla. Of course. Thank you so much. Yay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>